Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. Tonight on City Lights Live, we are thrilled to have with us Kate Zambrino discussing her new book, To Write As If Already Dead, published by Columbia University Press. On behalf of City Lights booksellers and publishers, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the summer season and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. So Kate Zambrino is a 2021 Guggenheim Fellow in nonfiction and the author of eight books, the most recent being Drifts, which is available now in paperback from Riverhead Books. She is at work on an essay collection titled The Missing Person, also to be published by Riverhead. She is a Strachan Donnelly Chair in Environmental Writing at Sarah Lawrence College and teaches in the graduate program at Columbia University. Joining her tonight in conversation will be T. Fleischman, the author of Time is the Thing a Body Moves Through and Zizigy Beauty. So they will be talking about an exceptionally breathtaking and multi-layered book. To write as if already dead pushes the boundaries of literary form. We are haunted by the aura of a writer that has been strangely neglected in the Anglophone world, despite his innovation and historical importance. Hervé Guibert becomes Cape Zambrino's and our companion in meditation on the nature of friendship, mortality, the precarity of life, the place of art and literature, and the threads that connect bodies in time and space. Hervé Guibert was a French novelist, photographer, and photography critic and video filmmaker who played a considerable role in changing French public attitudes towards AIDS. Uh, we are greatly honored to have Kate Zambrino with us tonight featuring this really exceptional work. Uh, before we begin, I would like to mention we'll be posting links for you to purchase books in the chat function of our Zoom dashboard. Uh, very important because that is what keeps City Lights in this series going. So please do purchase a book. We also have T. Fleischmann's books as well, as well as Hervé Guibert, and I suggest actually you double up on books because this is a good moment to do it. There's going to be a Q&A at the end of the discussion. You may also post your comments and questions in the chat function. Um, it is such a great pleasure to have you both with us here today. Kate Zambrino, T. Fleischman, welcome to City Lights Live. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Hi, Kate. Hi, Clutch. Hi. Congratulations on your um, <laughs> good time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very exciting. Congratulations on this really amazing book. Um, I'll hold it up for everyone. It's well, really I feel it's really nice to be in conversation with you because I feel like you were one of the first people a couple of years ago that I kind of, um, you know, started to ask myself whether I could actually write this book, like that we were in conversation about it, where I kind of worried about it and wondered about it. So it's nice to talk about it here. Yeah, definitely. I'm so glad it um, came into being. You say in the um, in the book, you talk about feeling like you're not um, cosmopolitan enough or queer enough <laughs> to write about um, Guibert, which is a really, um, I have a lot of questions about that. So m most of my questions are kind of circling. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I think, I think um, I, I I do think there is this there was this worry about um, but I think that for me um, you know I've been like many people I've been thinking a lot about Lauren Berlant the past couple of days and I have been reading so much of their work and um, I was reading just an essay that they wrote about criticism. And that how they and it, the essay is called genre flailing, um, and they were thinking about you know, like criticism that they like opened the object as opposed to closed it, mm -hmm. right? Like the sense of openness, and I, I think that that inquiry about um, who is allowed to write about whom, and also like the actual um, ethics of witness which is so much in Gebert's novel. I think that it's not a closed thing. It's an open, it's an open object for me throughout like the question of um, less cosmopolitanism and more um, like identity 
and and like who and also like questioning questioning what brings me pleasure questioning but not trying to foreclose it questioning like a desire like why why do I write so much of about you know these sort of these you know queer men um so many of who died of AIDS you know and so is there something am I is there something suspect about that is that something I can engage with openly and this was something you know I've been in conversation with you about um, also, as you were thinking through writing about Felix Gonzalez Torres um, and something I was in conversation with Sophia Samatar about, and that conversation is in the book, but just this idea of like how, how to be, I guess, to quote from Eve Sedgwick, like how to be, you know, who is herself quoting, um, you know, object relations theory, like how to be in a depressive position, a position of love as opposed to a paranoid position in thinking about Gebert. But yeah, I think that um, that question of writing about a body suffering, um, you know, that's a, that is a question. And um, you know, Lauren Berlan has called it the, the suffering of, com the commons of suffering. Mm -hmm. And I do think there is some of that that I am exploring, like the commons of suffering, but then also what's not what's not common, what's, what's, what's so obviously distinct that cannot, that cannot be compared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, you know, I'm glad you um, wrote this book for many reasons. I appreciate, you know, writing towards the um, discomfort or the sense that we shouldn't, you know, necessarily write about some things or some things feel like they're um, forbidden or, you know, um, they're not supposed to be related to in that way, but you find this really, um, you know, beautiful way of writing through affinity too, that is really, um, you know, speaks to me. And I really, really value seeing that in a work and finding a way to be with. And then also, of course, you're like kind of, you know, doing Guibert in certain ways, especially in this, the second half of it, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it feels, it feels like it becomes in, you know, the, the embodiment and all these, the, the speed and the, the time and the diary-ness of it, you know, like all these types of things. Well, I think there's also this question of like this pleasure in citation, like the mm -hmm. pleasure in um, other writers in a tradition of writers who are first and foremost deep readers, which Geber certainly is. I mean, To the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life is such an essay that's fiction about Thomas Bernhard, right, mm -hmm. who is also this writer who I'm deeply obsessed with. And like, what is that strain? There, there's something about like the tradition of the writer who shapes there's a shaping right mm -hmm. there's a sense of writing um you know writing this sort of witty acerbic um again lauren Ballant, like genre flailing right this flailing of genre that is in a way attempting to um like rewrite rewrite these like dominant modes of the ways that we, we communicate like bodies and identities. So I think, you know, I think there is, there is like Geber, who Geber was as a person and also how Geber died, which is like so deeply personal as well as historical. Like mm -hmm. he was such a deeply personal as well as a historical actor in, in his text. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this sort of crisis of the ordinary um, again, Berlant, but also like, I think that I am deeply feel myself in the company of um, writers who are kind of like obsessed and passionate with literature, right? So I think that there is this like embodiment and then a disembodiment at the same time. So I do think it's not only that I think that I am doing Gebert, but I think that I have been doing Gebert. Like, yeah. I think that he's been for a while, like really was since heroines has been um, the writer who's like maudlin, uh, uh, maudlin is a bad word, macabre sort of, it's a voice, is a tone, this like acidic, mm -hmm. like, like sped up everydayness. Um, I think that's always been someone who's I've, who I've, who is who I've been writing with or writing through. So yeah. Yeah. But then yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, 
you know, I th- there was a review that kind of made something about the line of me saying I'm a mom on a couch, but I think that's also like um, the couch, the couch as a position, yeah. Yeah, the couch is a position that Geber shares, that Bart shares, that uh, that mm-hmm. Kafka shared, right? To to write from the couch. So I think, but and also I think. Um, one of these, one of the things is I think in this book and like the past couple of books, I'm also really playing with gender mm-hmm. in ways that I find perhaps more slippery than how they've been like recognized or read. Yeah, I think, so there's um, the way I, I see the like performance of, of womanhood as being like the drag in yeah. your work, right? Yeah. Like, like that's where the, the draggy parts of it seem yeah. to be. Yeah, I think I'm a mom on a couch is very drag. It's like a yeah. very drag thing that I am saying in the text, as opposed yeah. to that's what's authentic and the yeah. desire to be Gaber is what's inauthentic or I don't know what's authentic. But yeah, I think that, I mean, I think being a, being a, a, a mother um, in this society is something that is incredibly flattening and overdetermined from the outside, mm-hmm. as opposed to the the more fluid idea of mothers, right? The fluid idea of mothers of different genders. I think that I don't know who I'm quoting there specifically. Um, I think it might be Christina Crosby, but yeah, I do think like since I became a mother, I have contended with um, loving being a mother. Mm-hmm. And like the the real deep like joy and, and pleasure in that, but then also like the so much of the flattening of that from the outside and the overdetermining of the body from the outside, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to like my actual felt experience of my gender or my body. Yeah. Well, and there's the way that the like the longing towards being the cute boy or the longing yeah there or whatever it is, right? Which is so important, I think, to a lot of your work, which I take yeah. really seriously as like uh, 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 also a, a form of, of being right so like the the mother thing like when I say that feels more drag it's also because I think that there's this way of you being uh, you, know, you know this like androgynous boy uh, that is is real too that comes through in in the writing and that yeah. I think is really important and like that connection is so important for the Gubert writing and that connection and is so shaping of so many of these forms and yeah I think that my writing, I think since screen tests in a very playful way, and then also drifts, I mean, drifts begins with um, like a very playful, like there were some reviews of drifts and not a single person brought up like why I was writing about Rilke, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a very playful um, reading of, you know, Renee Rilke named after his dead sister wearing dresses till 10 years old, you know? And like, that's like a very long reading of like these, a very more fluid concept of Victorian gender um, Mm -hmm. in terms of children. Um, And I think that, uh, and you know, and then there's like the Valerie Solanus playfulness and screen tests. Um, And then certainly, I think certainly in this book, there's there's the um, other self that's also Alex Suzuki in the first half. And then there's Geber in the second half. And I think that, yeah, I think that writing is where I often put um, my like desires and longings of like the private as opposed to the public self. That's this often this very like flattened self that's seen as what's real like this. And I think for me, um, I, especially the last couple of works, I've definitely played with different personas of gender in ways that feel like very fun and, and playful for me. But I've often, I've, yeah, I've often put little like longings, little like jokes. Like I think there's that line in this study where I speak about Alex Suzuki and Alex Suzuki's gender being um, uncertain what the, you know their gender identity would be now versus 10 years ago. Um, but like uh, this line about like how Guy Davenport wearing a t-shirt of a young Ludwig Wittgenstein is my gender, which I know is like also a meme on the internet, like what your gender is. But yeah, I think there's all sorts of like longing and playfulness towards 
um, gender and often a, a sense in my work um, as well. And, and how the work is read, I'm not trying to be like, you know, not trying to be, you know, Lauren Blount speaks of like the non-recognition is the only recognition we can have. But like often like how I'm read as, um, and I think I did it to myself with heroines. I think heroines is so much about woman writing. And I think, I mean, the truth is like my evolution is I'm much more interested in like slipperiness mm -hmm. um, and uh, much, you know, uh, you know, really, um, you know, like the space of work to play with that slipperiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the slipperiness. Well, you always, you've always tried to tell me that I'm queer than I am. Yeah. I feel like you've always had, you've always had faith in me that I was more queer than I was like, seeing <laughs> myself as being. But I do think there is a masquerade in the work. Like, I think the, the sense of Geber is less like, I, you know, is more like, yeah, I am him. Or what if I was him? Or what, how am I not him? And I think that, that that's a lot of the play. Yeah, and it makes me think more about the form that the book takes or the forms, I guess, right? It's like, there's maybe three or four forms you could think of the book as being in. Um, yeah. How these, like these formal traditions too, right? It, it reminds me of like, you're kind of pointing to these, you know, like Guibert, Barth, and this like kind of certain kind of like gay male, white, like, like European-ish, you know, um, certain era and these types of writing um, that you're working in and in conversation with, but also like you're referencing this, like the Sedgwick and the, the not cis gay male writers who are often writing in, I think, relation or, or you know, often in a critique role in relation to this type of stuff. So there's these couple different kind of forms that I can see you drawing from too and, and what I think is a really exciting way. And I think that happens in um, this one. Do you wanna, I wanted to, I did wanna ask you if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to the two forms, the book I think yeah. narrates, right? The, the coming to the forms, but. Well, I think, yeah, I think it is some genre flailing. I do think I had, I felt like I had to approach fiction in order to write um, the first half. And I felt um, really interested in, I, I am feeling, and again, this is like about the playfulness between genre and I guess genre along with gender. I, I felt like a detective story was the only way to write, um, this friendship in a way that I wanted to, and I wanted it to be fictionalized and I wanted it to feel speculative in a way that I felt like a straight memoir wouldn't have been able to do or wouldn't have been able to do in like the slippery way that I wanted it, it to. So I, you know, I, I did want it to be kind of about crossing boundaries, but yeah, it's, you know, that novella about, which is really about blogs, I mean, I think it's really about writing. Like, I think it's really about, you know, it's something that, you know, um, clutch, but I don't, you know, I, you know, Lauren Blount was my, was, was many, many people's advisors, but they were my advisor um, now almost 20 years ago. I feel very, I mean, not really. Yeah, no, yeah, oh yeah. Actually, I think 20 years ago, like I even went by another name then. Um, 20 years ago at University of Chicago. Um, and um, like that thinking through like pleasure and humor and genre, which is like what I thought about with them in my master's thesis is something I'm still thinking about. Um, but yeah, I felt like I wanted to do something that was about blog writing. And, you know, one of the ways I reconnected with Lauren Berlant was through their supervalent thought was through their blog at the same time I wrote Francis Farmer as my sister. And I think beyond the sense of the first half being about mentorship and about like romantic friendship and about like formless friendship and about the desire for writing, I think it's about a real desire for a blog space where one could write and write and write as much as possible and where one could be in deep collaboration in the comments and in deep community. And there was this constant thinking with that was happening that spilled over. And I, you know, wanted to write about this very tricky, um, slippery friendship that was a friendship in writing. Um, 
and to write about, you know, I've been thinking lately about um, the anthropologist Mark Augay's concept of a non-place like hotels or shopping malls. But I'm like wondering, like, was the blog a non-place where we didn't actually have to be our identities, mm -hmm. where we could be different genders, we could be different people, we could be different genres, mm -hmm. we could be different. I mean, one of the jokes is that the Alex Azuki character is like, an essayist is one person and then a poet is one person and then like a fiction writer is one person. So I knew that I needed to do like, I needed to be playful and hopefully open and hopefully generous and warm to write about Alex Suzuki. I couldn't do it in a straight way. So it became a sort of like a uh, way to write about their voice and falling in love with their voice. And I think having a mentor, although I didn't realize that at the time, someone much smarter than me who thought in language in such a serious way. And to me that mirrored the Foucault and Guibert yeah. um, friendship. And then the second half, I wanted it to be a sort of series of like a receipt or a notebook or a report, like all these different genres that I didn't know what it was, like a Guibert like diary or something like the pulses, the calendar pages of To The Friend, I knew that I wanted that to be the study. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I just felt like more and more I'm beginning to see form as, I look totally, at, it's like the fiction nonfiction to me, I, it's, it's not that, it's like, what, what is what are the form or forms that can put these feelings that can allow me to attempt to open as opposed to close? what I want to be thinking about. And I found, I found that like kind of detective story or report in the first half allowed me to write that friendship. And then the, the little boxes allowed me to write the second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Form is the thing that allows the, the being to happen and the, the affinity and the thinking and all that really resonates with me too. And the fiction- To allow the thinking to be throughout, to allow it to not be like, I know this is why I wanted to write this, but to allow yeah. that energy of thought in it. Yeah, and that's the kind of like I was saying, I feel like the form kind of narrates itself and reveals and takes shape as you're reading, right? I feel like I'm in the process of inhabiting the form and, and seeing the forms. Um, necessity or you know openness or, or whatever the case is as reading um, and so like the the way that this fits into like the identity stuff is really interesting to me as well as you place yourself in, in that world it really lets all these other things happen you know these other thought was, occurrences you know the the space of blogs like I think that unless you were I mean and there's also like live journal earlier or there's like now there's like different forums like I'm just not part of it now I have different sort of collaborations over writing with people or in person, but like the blogs were like, I remember when I first read Supervalent Thought, Lauren Ballant's blog, or when I first read Bono Capil's blog, like I was so sick with excitement. I just like, couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle like the fact that there was this writing that was so of the ordinary and was so about the event of the ordinary, but was a way to narrate the crisis of the mm -hmm. ordinary and the way to like deeply think through literature and art and life that wasn't like um, made so like stodgy by being called literary criticism or a review. Like it was a, it was a totally way outside of it. And I think, you know, as opposed to feeling like I've, moved on from that time, I think I'm always looking to return, to return to that space of, which I think is also like the space of the private notebook, which, you know, I'm very interested, in. I know Gaber is very interested in and writes about quite a lot, but like how to return to writing that feels daily, that feels ephemeral, that feels really thinking through something and hopefully thinking through others. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, we haven't talked about, uh, there's a, a component of this book and throughout your work that I always am really um, drawn to and feel like I learn a lot from, which is the thinking of 
capitalism and how, you know, the labor of writing and writing as labor and the ways that capitalism and, and you know, these unjust workforces are shaping the work that we're doing and the ways thinking occurs and all that. And the blogs really are this space because, you know, the blog can't be, or at least especially back then, maybe things are a bit different now, but like you can't put your blog on the CV, right? Like it's not allowed, yeah. to, be, it's yes. not allowed to have these other forms of value or seriousness. So I'm thinking about like the, like you're saying the formlessness of friendship and how these things can happen through there versus like the mentorship, which is more um, because it's structured and there's the power dynamic and all that. It can't, it might try to be formless, like mentorship can be formlessness, but the institution and these other concerns make that really fraught or possibly, you know, violent even or controlling or like there's all these, these problems there. So seeing the blogs as a space also that um, can kind of escape these other things that are troubling and problematizing the text and the way we have to like be killing ourselves to, to write through the capitalist. Yeah, and I think and I think that's why I view Alex Suzuki, which is I mean a fictional a fictional character based on a based on a real discursive presence who is many different writers. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I am really engaging with Alex Suzuki's um, deep desire not to see writing as a market form, which is more of the desire of a, a poet or a poetry or a mm -hmm. prose. Um, and I think I'm seeing that as something I shared and something that I have, in order to continue, have had to move away from and have I feel some sense of loss about. And I think that the way reason most people in that very specific micro world gave up their blogs is they were beginning to feel themselves become um, mechanisms of publicity or commodifying forces mm -hmm. and I think yeah it was it was really supposed to be this like amateur space that was a space of like actual thinking mm -hmm. and not promoting but of course promoting also happened there was so much and I think you know I I agree that I think <laughs> I think that the past couple of books the thing that I am doing is interesting is starting to write about capitalism but I feel like I've just started like I feel like I'm always learning and that's something that I want to and I think I think this book I tried to write it in kind of sly and mischievous ways because mm -hmm. it's not like oh being a writer is such a huge labor it's more than that it's that we are supposed to work all the time mm -hmm. like we are supposed to fucking work all the time and sometimes and I've and I've become to this and I feel like you have always been so much more aware of this than me and I'm now like I I viewed you as a mentor with this and I'm just really catching on to now that I'm supposedly achieving like some measures of success, that's to like tell others that, that this is a life that you should want, like a dream job. And there's no such thing as a dream job because we shouldn't want to work all the time. Mm -hmm. Like we just shouldn't want to work all the time. <laughs> like, and yeah, like to me, yeah. writing is not like the truth is, and like I, the truth is, and I think that I've started speaking about this because writing and community is wonderful. And I do think being a thinker is really important, but I think being a thinker is often being antithetical to these institutions and in, you know, really, really skeptical relationship, if not direct antagonistic relationship to the way capitalism and art meet, even if we're of course unwilling and willing players in it. And I think there's so much this idea of like, oh, well, you can be a writer and then that can be this way of life. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that we currently live in a society that doesn't sustain it. That even if you achieve these um, huge measures of success, it's probably not enough. It's mm -hmm. probably not enough. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I satirize in the Geber book is like just how much I spent giving readings, like mm -hmm. how much I spent traveling. Yeah. Um, and it's like, such unpaid labor and and why and why is that and I think I've just you know and I was I've just been rereading cruel optimism I've been thinking a lot about Mark Fisher's idea of capitalist realism and Mark Fisher is you know also this blog k-pop that was so important to me um but I think that not k-pop k-pop is something else what was the k someone k-punk but um 
you know, just thinking like how it's attached to education, like how it's attached to these institutions of education that we have this notion, like I was reading this anthropological text today and John, my partner was like, well, you should get a PhD in anthropology. I was like, yes, I should right now <laughs> go get a PhD in anthropology for like what, like what does that open up for me in terms of the good life? Like nothing, it would open up nothing. Like I yeah. should just read it. I should just read what I want to read and think what I want to think and not expect institutions to fully support me because um, they don't fully support anyone. Yeah. Because they're by their nature like, cruel and hostile to, to space and time. And, you know, and you've, you've always, I feel like you've, you've made a life, you've made life your art and thinking through that. And I think I've been, I don't know. I feel like I'm just waking up to it. <laughs> I feel like in just like the past couple of weeks, I'm just like, yes, I'm a writer, but it's, it's not like that's unyoked to capitalism. And I think sometimes there's that idea that it's not being a worker when of course it is. Yeah. And like, you know, the university and the publishing houses and stuff really want to continue this fiction that it is unyoked from capitalism, right? Like the, the right. Like they really don't, it's like really, and this is another thing I was thinking about, like with Guibert, there's all the betrayals, right? These like constant betrayal, like the, the writing is betraying the friend and all these types of things. And I was thinking, as I was rereading, I was rereading um, Try to Zip Already Dead today and thinking, okay, where are the betrayals in here? Like what's being betrayed? And one of the things that you do betray increasingly is the university, right? And, and betraying like, this is how the money came and then I go and, there's also like a betrayal of the of motherhood and the, the child and sort of by writing, you know, there's all this kind of betrayals happening, which I, I think plays into that too. And the, the mischief and pleasure of that. Well, the college and university has betrayed me and betrayed everyone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like they're structured to do so. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you and I have both had, have had various, you know, unnamed experiences, you know, with that. But I think there's also this, interesting structure that happens where precarious workers who are not tenured are expected to be mentors and are expected to do constant emotional labor and want to and want to have those connections and want to engage within community but it's you know I've been thinking a lot about you know Fred Moten's idea of the undercommons which I'm trying to study as well like is there possible and you know he, he's writing so much about a blackness within these institutions and within universities and the possibilities of fugitive studies. And I think, but he's also incorporating the concept of the precariat of the adjunct of the, you know, full-time non-tenured, like, is there a possibility within this to still have transformation in terms of knowledge? But I think we're all, you know, I think anyone who's hitched themselves to an institution hoping to have transformation is going to be sadly. Um, yeah, it's not. Not yeah, it's not. It's not, well, where is it then? And I do think there is a sense of friendship, community, mm -hmm. um, not committee, not committee, but community. Yeah. And this pot, and I have felt, you know, at the places where I teach um, among graduate students, among undergrads, and among faculty, I have felt real, real conversation. I have felt, um, you know, like a real, like search for it, but it's it's not in it's not in the commons of the yeah. university. It's in it's in what we create in opposition to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I love that we talk about. I'm. I think I quoted this earlier, but formlessness of friendship. Right. The that friendship is a thing that through its formlessness and the way it can escape from expectations and all these things, I think, um, get around and, and circumvent some of these other things and the potential for finding that um, through all these places, but also the the erotics of friendship to the Alex Suzuki, um, you know, kind of mystery and correspondences and the way um, the writing itself and the book itself and the form itself manage always to have these uh, in your work always have these like erotic charges and the these these charges of friendship and stuff through there too, the intimacy of it. Yeah, I think that 
Yeah, I think that, well, the, the formless of friendship is formless is from an interview that Foucault gave, like Foucault, like Laurent Blanc, or like the interview was really his, um, like great, I feel like it was his great form, his yeah. great genre, right? Because mm-hmm. he could just like talk and talk and talk and, and, mm-hmm. and theorize so much, um, you know, and he theorized that, you know, there should be this erotics of friendship as a way to pass through knowledge and that it should take place between, between, between men and it should be intergenerational and I do think there is I think in this work I am playfully saying well what if you don't what if you weren't in Foucault's circle yeah like what if you wouldn't fit in Foucault's circle um is there a way to still have that sense of friendship where it is you know a way of being together an intimacy a, a, a transfer of knowledge. And I think that's what I'm seeing in the Alex Suzuki figure. And I, yeah, I do think there is a real love there. I think there's a real eroticism there between um, between that. And I think between like all my friends, like all my friends and that sort of love and that sort of love that's attached to knowledge and the desire for knowledge and the love for literature. But I, I do think though that, I don't know how to say this, I don't know how to say this, so I'm just going to say this. I do think, you know, the mentor relationship, the formless friendship like Foucault had, and mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's not without power relations. Like, of course, it's power. embedded within power relationships and it's ripe for abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, that boundaryless, boundarylessness, the atmosphere of no boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I do think there's a real betrayal in writing about the Alex Suzuki figure, but I do think there is this real sense of elegy and desire to, to, to write about the knowledge produced and the thinking through within that friendship, which is so much about, which was so playful and so much about Foucault. I mean, we yeah. basically just spoke about Foucault all the time and wrote about, and spoke about, you know, so there is that, um, that mirroring, but I do, yeah, I do think that um, these are not without their melancholies and their, um, it's pathos. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the, um, because Guibert was an asshole too, right? Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate that. (laughs) In this, yeah. It's like, what if you're not in Foucault's circle of like beautiful, you know, um, men? And I think we always, I think we both find ourselves like kind of at these like, you know, fractured outside relations with these like, you know, imagined or real circles of faggots who who are like sharing ideas, right? Um, but the, the way you're, you like cut through all that and point out just like how bullshit, you know, that actually that whole eroticized relationship is um, the, the, kind, the kind of like Socratic, right? Or whatever thing. And also just like you very, you call, you know, you, you, the, the weird pedophilia and the, the just yeah the and all these things get like I mean you and I have talked about that so much with Gebert I feel like and I think I you know I do spell it out in this book like it's really hard for me to read you know the very beautiful mausoleum of lovers that Natanel translated it's hard for me to read all of it mm-hmm. it's very difficult to um because there is obvious uh, like very casual treatment of abuse in it yeah. um and you know I think that Gebert was incredibly um complex you know I think that he he was capable of you know great tenderness um mm-hmm. um sorry I'm looking at the question he was capable of great tenderness as well as cruelties and I think that it, that comes through in his work right the both the tenderness and the cruelties and I do think that um that's why I think I'm really interested in his illness works there's something really stripped down about his illness works where all the sort of um, glamor in some ways of that period of the Foucault period kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. And there's a real, there's a real sense of um, his interest in the pathetic and the ordinary and the sort of commons of suffering in the body. So there is something like, I mean, I love, you know, crazy for Vincent as a text, um, you know, or I love the diaries or, but I do, I do think it is his illness texts, not because it's more noble, his suffering, but I think that there is like some of the bullshit gets stripped away yeah, exactly. in those texts. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Do, um, was there questions that we should, that you Yeah, there's like a lot of questions. Oh. Sorry, we're just like chatting. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like we could chat for a while. Yeah. Okay. So if anyone has any questions, hi, Matilda. Um, seeing Matilda in the chat. Um, uh, I think the aspiration is itself a capitalist concept. I would love to work in academia or have a more intellectual job, especially because I feel judged within the writing community for not having academic relations or a less blue collar job. Sure, sure. Interesting. What do you think of this, especially in terms of all the adjuncting your job? job? Yeah, so what I'm saying about my accomplishments is that I have tried to like find pride in my accomplishments, but it's also we live in a society that it's very hard to be a working artist or a writer. And there are very, very few who can do that without having other jobs. Like, so I think that there is a, um, and this is something I try to spell out very clearly because I often think that the whole system of publishing in the MFA world gets people into tons of debt because they think that that's necessary in order to be a writer or that, that you attain a good life someday. I think what I'm trying to say is that the notion of the, I'm like just parroting Lauren Berlant and this is not my idea. This is obviously their idea, but it's, it comes true. It's very true to me that I'm not saying that this is specific to the life of a writer, but I think that the idea of a good life is a fantasy, right? The idea that we, that some most people are precarious and precarity is like the condition in which we live in now. And so, I mean, that's no unique, that's not unique to being a writer or to working in childcare. And of course you can be a writer and also work in childcare. Um, and I think that, um, one of the things I think through in the Geber book, and this is not saying get the Geber book, but it is something I try to think through is like, what is the fantasy? Is the fantasy like, cause the character Eric, Alex Suzuki has a completely other job, has like a tech job. And so, you know, is the fantasy that they are somehow able to write more because even though they have a nine to five, it's like a white collar and they make money and then, and that somehow they have their mind free. And then I conclude that that's incredibly unfair and that actually the only fantasy is to be independently wealthy. Like that's the fantasy, right? Like that's the only, because the rest, the rest of it is that it is, it is a struggle and that all of us try to find beauty and hope and love um, in, antithetical to, to all of this. And yeah, I think that being a, you know, it's, 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 I do think, I will say, and this sounds like I'm shitting on the places where I work, but I think that there is like the sense that like you have to teach in order to be a writer, that like, that that's the thing. And like, I've known people who have been very happy leaving academia, including yeah. you, Clutch. Yeah, I'm very, very happy to have largely, you know, it's funny because like, again, I think of like betraying academia as one of the things to betray and I'm like, I have left academia largely, but I still feel like a qualified because it always gets you, you know? And then I'm like, well, if I, I, you know, I'm not independently wealthy, so maybe I'm not gonna, maybe the escape from academia, despite how happy I am about it, it, it is like even itself, you know, not not real. And like, I, I'll, I'll get like sucked back into it at some point. Well, I think that the truth is, is that universities <laughs> universities depend on graduate labor and adjunct labor in order to make shitloads of money mm -hmm. and like charge shitloads of tuition and adjuncts don't make living wages yeah. like adjuncts just don't make living wages like even at the most prestigious places they don't make living wages like for the most part and don't make health insurance so yeah. i think that um you know like these places you know and i'm published on columbia university press which is like you know within the university, but outs outside of it. I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't the relationship there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, there is this like little dirty secret of, you know, who, who actually is, has stability. And I think, you know, for the most part, the promise of stability in being a writer is um, not there, but you, you can of course be a writer and have other jobs. <laughs> that's, 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 of course you can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you wanna speak at all to that clutch, like having other jobs or doing other things? 
Well, yeah, but I'm not going to talk about what my other job is right now. I know, I know. <laughs> right, but there are many other different sorts of things that you can do. And I think about that in the Gebert study. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this incredible freedom in what I'm allowed to say now, even in things like this, because of not being, not trying to have an academic career. And also then like this funny thing where like, you know, the types of books we write are not like, these huge bestsellers, right? Um, you know, there's like thinking of, you know, to the point of doing that save my life then becoming this huge um, seller for, for Guy Bear too. But like the, like the, the books themselves aren't expected to be the capitalist, like big money maker, you know, necessarily. They're not supposed to be like Harry Potter or something like this. So also like getting, but getting away from that and feeling like the freedom of not having to have those considerations and again I think there's like I'm really loving the way you're you're writing about this type of thing and writing through this type of thing and to write as if already dead and um also like the sickness because I'm thinking about the way like because I've been very very sick for the last few years and like adjusting my life and like writing through that and learning how to write through that and seeing the ways that you're writing through these sicknesses that are coming at us through these other you know institutes like are they're making us physically sick in order to write as you're you're putting in there um and just how that, yeah, how that works together. Yeah, I think that was one of the main things that I was interested in is, you know, what it's like to write when you are exhausted or sick yeah. and how that actually changes the form. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and seeing Geber, I mean, Geber, obviously, you know, Geber at the time, you know, his diagnosis was a death sentence. So Geber was dying. Um, and, you know, this the drugs he took also made him sicker, you know, which we know now. Um, so, and, you know, and he was always oscillating with thoughts of suicide with his work, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I was very interested in like what, you know, yeah, that crisis of the body and how, how the crisis of the body affects, affects the form. Um, someone mentioned Cin Cynthia Cruz, Cindy Cruz, who's a great writer and also writes from a working class position, which both, me and Clutch come from as well. Yeah, the Clutch. Th that book sounds great. Yeah. Um, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. I read the Alex Suzuki story. is incredibly sad. Or how can I come Alex Suzuki but forever? This is my question. I think the Alex Suzuki story is incredibly sad, but I do think that I do not feel sad for Alex Suzuki, the writer. I feel. Um, I feel Alex Suzuki has carried on a beautiful practice of writing and in the futurity, I mean, I don't really, I don't write characters, right? <laughs> so, but like in the future, like I don't, I don't pity or feel sorry for Alex Suzuki. I feel like Alex Suzuki has the right sort of um, sense of absurdity and beauty in terms of writing, because certainly being a writer is incredibly absurd and can often be beautiful and meaningful. Um, I do think it's sad. I do think Sophia um, that community is really hard. I think community is very difficult to sustain. And I do feel, I do feel, I do feel sad that I feel sad about the friendships I've lost from the blog and from that time. And I also feel like there are people who think, you know, you know, I think there's a lot of competition also that comes in with being writers. And so it's been, I've been really, I feel really lucky to find friends who it's, it is about just engaging with ideas in life and also like not taking ourselves too seriously, like not taking it too seriously. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is a sad story. I think it is a sad story in that it's a loss of a friendship, but I do think, you know, friendships, you know, friendships are ephemeral too, right? Like friendships are these sad, beautiful love stories in some ways. Yeah. Are we doing on time? Should we answer any more? Are we almost done? Hi, Sophia. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mark Fisher. I'm just really starting to read Mark Fisher and really like everything, like the weird book, the book on hauntology, 
the book on capitalist realism. Do we have time for one more? You've mentioned that, correct me if I'm wrong, in Heroines You Wrote as a Woman. And elsewhere in an interview, you mentioned that you're bored or less interested in writing from a feminist lens. Do you think this is a natural progression for women writers? Do you think that to be a woman can be transcended? Thank you. I love to hear from you, Clutch. Clutch, there is this passage in Dress, I want to say, that I cut, but it's about a conversation between me and Clutch in Dress. And I think I showed you the passage and then I cut it. And I think I cut it to keep my job at the place I was talking about. And then they fired me anyway, because I like signed the union contract. So that's the, great. But what was the passage? What? what was the passage? The passage was about um, like being with a bunch of tenured professors and um, having them like kind of make fun of me too and make fun of like, do you remember this? Make fun of like um, activism and like, um, and then I, I say something like, you know, that you, and, oh, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, well, it is a similar passage, but it is about how like the lawyer comes to the meeting and says, you can't sleep with your students. Oh, and then yeah. you and I are like, who would want to sleep with your students? And like feeling a horror and like how we identify maybe more as feminists than in terms of queer theory, mm -hmm. which I was like telling, you know, I don't, I don't even know, but I think that was just like a conversation we once had about like boundaries and like abuse. And because I do think there is a sense within like queer theory, like at least the origins of queer theory of this, of the formlessness of friendship of this very Foucauldian idea of power relationships, which are rightfully checked and looked at now in terms of, you know, yeah, abuses of power and, um, you know, what, you know, what is going on in, in universities, you know, et cetera. So it's just like, I cut it. I don't know why I cut it. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because it's like the like transcending um, womanhood or like these these questions of femininity, too, where there's like a way that um, I feel like you you really do just actually step outside of that. I yeah. feel like you're tangled down by those um, questions. I, I see other writers doing that. I feel maybe get tangled down and like uh like an oh no or something about about some of those questions right like like what it like how can I transcend a womanhood or something like this or what is it and I feel yeah like you're, you're writing actually and you actually live like you, you know in a bit of a different space space than that and I see and I see your work is like again like it's like the longing towards being the cute boy that I read not simply <laughs> as a kind of like oh I kind of want to be a cute boy but more as a yeah and you know you don't um go and try to claim any kind of transness um no and, and I think that that's you know I, I would probably be really annoyed by you if you were yeah okay. <laughs> you gotta <laughs> check me clutch but, yeah but, but you're like you know you're, you're doing it something that's very specific to like your experience and your reading experience and your lived experience that is really beautiful interesting to me that I think isn't really about necessarily like those other things come in I think as problems that you have to navigate through but your work is is moving and like the, the Gibert book right it's it, I don't know that it necessarily transcends the yeah I don't think it transcends being but but I think I think in heroines I think I wrote heroines when I was so heroines was published 10 years ago um and I think that I was really naive over how flattening like the language I used in heroines. And also that was a lot of the marketing copy, copy too. Like I kept on using girls and women. And I think my knowledge of gender now is just much more like all encompassing and fluid, not only for myself, but for mm -hmm. others. So I think I would have taken more care in heroines to reflect upon, um, you know, women but not women as this like one like um like this one like like I wasn't talking about it's it's it smacks of a little essentialist in heroines I think in a way that was totally unintended and I think that I'm much more interested in um how gender flattens often and yeah. concepts of flattening but also, you know, interested in um, still, I'm still interested in patriarchy, like I, and especially as it relates, like I'm still interested in writing about 
you know, patriarchy and writing about, um, but I think I'm less, I think that I'm a little less interested in seeing my work as feminist, just because I feel from a literary criticism perspective that can be a very flattening way to read art. Yeah. You know, and because it's like a very singular lens, which I don't know, which like the work that I like that is, um, you know, not written by cis men is much more like playful and slippery and mm -hmm. contains so many um, ugly feelings that I think to read a work, whether it's like feminist enough, I think is a pretty flattening way of reading it. But I don't think I've tr transcended. I don't think being a woman is something that you transcend. I think some people are women and some people aren't women and some people are neither, right? So I think that certainly for me in my work, I'm interested in like playing with the not I as much as the I. I'm interested in theatricality and performance and um, and slipperiness. Um, that's just what I find like personally incredibly like fulfilling and interesting is to write about like what's beyond the self or like selves and like multiplicity. But the, I, I don't think that that like is like antithetical to feminism or antithetical to like feminist art as I know it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are we are we at time? I think we well, might be. On, on that note, <laughs> yeah, I kind of wish there were like in an alternate universe, we had like this sort of channel that would just go on forever and we could just yeah. continue this <laughs> conversation because I am so digging it. Thank you both so much. Thanks, this Peter. So much yeah. fun. And thank you all for being here. Please be well, be safe, and hope to see you all again soon. Bye, Clutch. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you all.